good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good middle of the night, where, wherever you are. Um, my name is Nigel Topping, the uh, UN High Level Climate Action Champion for COP26, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this discussion, this crucial discussion about the next steps towards consigning coal to history at COP26. Um, we, we, we've got a great set of speakers. Let me just um, set the scene and hand over to Minister Wilkinson, um, co-chair of the Power and Pass Coal Alliance, for some remarks, then we get into the discussion. Um, now, we, we've seen huge momentum in the last 12 months uh, towards normalising net zero by 2050 or sooner um, as the goal for the real economy. We have over 4,500 companies, cities and investors um, in the race to zero. Um, over 160 institutional investors with over $70 trillion of capital under management committing to get to zero. So great momentum. But we know we can't get there unless we go through the big topics like deforestation, fossil fuels and coal phase out. And, and we all know that coal power remains the primary driver of climate change. So phasing out coal from the electricity sector is the single most important step to get in line with the 1.5 degree goal. And the recent IEA roadmap has showed that, that we need to stop construction of any new coal power plant immediately and phase them out completely by 2040, globally by 2030 in advanced economies. Um, and the recent G7 summit in Cornwall, not far from where I am here in Devon, um, provided a really important platform to strengthen those phase out efforts. I think what's really interesting is that um, the economics are in favour of this transition. The carbon tracker analysis recently showed, just a couple of years ago now, so it's changing, that more than 41% of global coal capacity was already class, cash flow negative. So we're going to have a really good discussion on how governments, finance actors and businesses can take action on this really key issue. But to set the scene, I'm delighted to be able to um, introduce uh, the Honourable Jonathan Wilkinson, Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change and the co-chair of the Power and Pass Coal Alliance. Over to you, Jonathan. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining this Powering Past Coal Alliance Business and Finance Panel. While I certainly wish that I could be with you live today, it is certainly a pleasure to share my thoughts in this recorded video. L'objectif du panel d'aujourd'hui est de souligner le leadership du secteur privé dans l'élimination progressive du charbon et d'accueillir les nouveaux membres qui rejoignent l'Alliance. In addition, the business and finance leaders will candidly discuss today some of the challenges they have had to overcome in developing plans to phase out coal. As momentum builds in the private sector to advance net zero and climate change commitments, the accelerated phase out of coal is the credible minimum benchmark needed for these commitments to have meaningful effect. We welcome the leadership shown by the new members of the PPCA and the work of all business and finance leaders in the PPCA who are developing business models that are strong, sustainable, and resilient. I'd like to, to highlight one leadership example from Canada, the company Capital Power. Capital Power owns over 6,400 megawatts of generation capacity across North America, and it knows firsthand about the low carbon energy transition and how it can give rise to competitive economic opportunities. Capital Power has announced its intention to repower its Genesee facility to utilize 100% natural gas and move off coal in 2023. As part of this conversion, the company intends to use natural gas combined cycle technology. Moreover, the Genesee conversion will also be hydrogen capable and carbon conversion ready. These transformations will significantly extend the useful life of the facility, given the declining economics of coal power. This is part of a broader shift to a low carbon energy portfolio for this company with its plans to increase renewable generation towards net carbon neutrality by 2050. The decision to repower the Genesee facility provides us with a paradigm example of how the transition can be used to advance innovative solutions successfully. À tous les nouveaux membres qui se joignent à nous aujourd'hui, nous sommes heureux de vous voir rejoindre l'Alliance comptant plus de 125 pays, institutions financières et entreprises. And we look forward to working with you on this journey, a journey that will see members redouble their efforts and partner on the road to COP26 and Net Zero. 
Right, well, th thank you, Minister. And, and as the Minister says, um, the, the Power and Pass Coal Alliance is growing and we're going to hear from several new members today. So when, when the speakers are, are from a new member, make sure you let everybody know that you're just joining and why. And of course, that will in in include Capital Power, who the Minister mentioned. Um, uh, so this, the, the, the really core part of this conversation is going to be hearing from leaders from the finance community and from the business community. Um, and I'm delighted that, to be joined by um, three leaders from the finance committee, Caroline Lemol from Amundi, the asset manager, uh, uh, Nick Spooner um, from Hermes, uh, another asset manager, and Claudia Cruzer from ABP, um, the, the pension fund. And then from the business community, we're going to hear from Brian Vasjo from Capital Power, who the minister mentioned, um, Denise Bauer from Mo McDonald Group, uh, big engineering consultancy, and then Claire O'Neill uh, uh, from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. But I'm, going to, I'm going to start with um, the, the, our, our finance um, leaders, um, because the motivations for joining, I think, are slightly different for the finance sector and the business sector. And then I'm really keen on the inter intersection between the two. So let me start by asking our three finance leaders just for some introductory thoughts on um, how joining the Parent Pascal Alliance fits with your broader climate goals. Um, uh, and, and in particular, if you could say something about this, this continual debate around engagement versus divestment, um, it would be, be really helpful. So let, 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 let's start with, um, with Caroline um, from Amundi. Over to you, Caroline. Yes, hello, uh, hello, Nigel. Um, so Amundi is uh, is pushing a lot into its uh, race into net zero, and especially for us, uh, phasing out from coal is uh, very is paramount. And we want to be. Uh, so you were mentioning about the uh, divestment, uh, rather engagement. Somehow we are in between. We are. Uh, uh, divesting parts of our exposure to coal and at the same time we are doing a lot of engagement with a company we are invested in which are st uh, still some uh, coal uh, exposure we are asking them to publish uh, a phase out plan uh, in uh, before 2023 and a phase out plan which is uh, before 2030 for OECD country, 2040 for non-OECD countries. And depending on the result, and uh, if they have a, a, a good phase out plan, we will keep investing in those. And if not, we will divest steadily. And so, so Gary, Gary, that, that, that's what I like to call um, engagement with teeth. Right? Yeah. Enga <laughs> engagement with cons, because if there's no point in engaging forever, right? You have to have, that's to be a consequence eventually. And those those figures you mentioned, they're exactly in line with the IEA, right? 2030. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, great. Okay. And Thank the, you. the Sorry. thing is, why we are doing that is that because we are also very conscious of the social impact of uh, of the energy transition the what yeah. we call fair transition so we want to to company to be ambitious but pragmatic we want them to to phase out for coal but also when they are doing so take into account the employee part the the also the local part you know the the territories where where they are shutting down uh, facilities how they are they are doing it uh, do they speak to the locals to uh, to find the solutions so we want something uh, that is uh, um, how to say uh, conscious of the uh, social impact because we think that if at any time we have a social pushback we won't be able to uh, to do the energy transition so we want to to uh, phase out for coal but also to find a solution for the people who are benefiting from this color exposure at the same time so that's why we think that being together, being a coalition, uh, it's really important because we can uh, uh, find solution together and we can be more credible uh, with the company we are engaging when we are part of a coalition. Great, thanks, Karen. And of course, um, m many people have said this is the first inevitable um, industrial revolution, but having clear end dates allows people to plan. So I think it's a really good point you make about nowhere more important to plan than at the community level where communities have relied on coal. So that, thank you for emphasizing the importance of the, the just transition. Um, let, let, me, let me turn now to, to Nick Spooner um, at, at Hermes. 
Nick, over to you. How, how, how does joining PPCA fit with your, your goals? Thanks, Nigel. Um, I sit within the engagement team at Federated Hermes, so we'll focus on that as well. And very much building on Caroline's points before, uh, coal phase-out and the Just Transition are a core part of our engagement strategy with utilities, with mining companies and other companies within the value chain as well. To your point around bringing teeth to our engagement around uh, coal phase-out, we've been systematically integrating data around the coal phase-out into our voting strategy and our vote recommendation. So we've been using the global coal exit list to look at companies that are expanding coal and voting against directors where we think companies have uh, strategies which are misaligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So that's one way in which we think we're bringing teeth, but we look to use all the tools we have as investors to influence change. Another one of those that I'd like to mention is around public policy engagement. And I think investors have a sort of a strong responsibility to be engaging with governments, which we have been doing, but also we've been engaging with the IEA around the publication of the new 1.5 degree report. So I had the privilege of going to Paris and seeing Fatty Gourol two years ago with a bunch of investors to go and um, state our views around the importance of a 1.5 degree scenario. And clearly, as you mentioned, the phase out of coal is a central part to that, to the, to that scenario. Nick, could you just for those people who don't understand the nuance, and this includes me, um, you talk about voting against directors. Of course, the, 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 the very high profile example recently of shareholders voting out of office directors at Exxon. But are you talking about voting for the appointment of directors or are you talking about something differently when you say voting against directors? So... Exxon is a very specific case where there was a proxy contest where shareholders were challenging the directors that were being uh, for, for the shareholders to vote upon. But most companies have annual director elections. And so that gives an opportunity to re-elect directors every year. And so we've been opposing some directors based on their plans around coal because we don't think they're meeting their fiduciary duties in terms of managing climate related risks. Great. So it's not just voting against the content of a report. It's actually saying we don't think you're competent to run the business that, exactly, you, that, that yeah. we own a part of. That's a quite a strong message. Um, uh, and I think also um, really interesting, I, the, 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 that engagement on the IEA, I was just speaking to an, a, a, a heavy industry um, you know, global body, and they've done work on aligning with previous IEA's well below two degree scenarios, but didn't have data set to align with the 1.5 degree scenario because it wasn't published. So I'm sure there's going to be some really helpful consequences of that publication. Exactly. Th thanks for helping get them over the line. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Great. That, thanks, Nick. Let, let me turn now to, to Claudia. Claudia from ABP. Claudia, same question to you, but maybe you could just draw out what the differences are um, as a as a asset owner as opposed to um, an asset manager and um, things that you're running a big pension fund. Yeah, thank you very much, Nigel. So, you know, ABP manages 500 billion on behalf of Dutch pensioners and uh, we serve every sixth person in the Netherlands gets the pension from us. So that's 3 million civil servants and teachers in the Netherlands that ABP serves of the Telsey, it's a rather small country. But you know, a teacher that starts his or her career today will enjoy its pension in 2070. So therefore the action we are taking now is of paramount importance for them to be able to enjoy their pension in a sustainable world. And um, for us, the alliance is very much in line with policy commitments that we started making in 2015 around carbon footprint reduction, around investing in opportunities around renewable energy. And then most lately in 2020, we committed to being net zero by 2050. And that is of course a path we are on now and implementing it in the portfolio. But it is also very much about um, taking a view that we want to phase out um, a gradual phase out of investment in coal that um, and that you know we're taking that step by step looking at mining companies looking at utilities etc and then also um, you know that uh, after 2025 which is that milestone we will look to reduce the exposure to coal further coming to your question about engagement we strongly believe that through engagement if it is well done can have a really strong impact and we have a number of examples of that where companies have announced um, either that they will stop um, coal-fired coal -fired power plants 
or you know, that they will align their business strategy, et cetera. But we also have cases where companies haven't done so, and then we can choose to divest. And for example, Kepco is one of those companies where we didn't agree with their climate commitments and ultimately chose to no longer be invested in them. Just, just, um, just to help me understand and the listeners, the dynamic between asset owners and asset. Are you are you managing all of your own assets, or are you your your point asset managers for chunk of your so portfolio? ABG is the pension fund, and yeah. APG is its fiduciary manager. So the implementation sits with APG, and uh, that's so. You, so, so you kind of so you, so you, so you have a one to one relationship with your own asset manager, effectively. Yeah, it's a one to one relationship, and it is also one that is very close, and we're very clear targets um, have been defined and where it is part of the SLA, it is part of the strategic investment plan. So this is not a nice to have. This is really integral to how we invest the money on behalf of the beneficiaries. Yeah. And perhaps, you know, if I'm, so I'm not Dutch myself, but I'm always amazed about the Dutch context because here we have a Dutch climate accord, which is a collaboration between government and all business sector and including the financial sector. So commitments are being made about the transition that involves every part of society, which is, of course, the way we like to work and believe that has the greatest impact, and hence also joining this alliance. Great, thank you, Claudia. I might, I'm, I'm, I might come back um, uh, to, to, to Caroline and Nick later to ask them about how. In fact, let me ask you now. We've got we've, we're doing great for time. Nick and Caroline, I, I just want to ask you. Um, so your asset managers, so you're managing asset owners' money, like pension funds' money. What have you seen changing in the dynamic of the relationship between asset owners and asset managers in the last couple of years around issues like powering past coal? I mean, is, is this becoming a norm that, as an asset manager, you really have to commit to if you want to win mandates, or is there still a lot of room to, to, to go? Uh, maybe I can start, Nick, if you don't, <laughs> if you agree. Uh, I think there is a globally, uh, um, all asset owners, at least in Europe, are, uh, are, are integrating some kind of ESG and climate uh, uh, angle when they are, they are doing RFP. Uh, I think even in Asia, more and more you have this uh, this uh, demand. Uh, so maybe uh, you have so, some some uh, region where it's less less vivid than in Europe. But globally, in Europe, we I think asset owner have been driving the, uh, our own journey towards this uh, more ESG and climate. Uh, focus of the uh, of the finance. Um, one of the one of the reason. I mean, we still the the, the fight is not uh, is not uh, one for. Uh, we still have to to convince some of the uh, people. Uh, Sometimes where we are engaging the companies. Uh, especially on the company level uh, in the US or in Asia, uh, what seems to be obvious when you are you are a base in Europe might not be as obvious, like uh, you know, uh, excluding the coal developers, uh, um, uh, you know, the 2030 2040 deadline, which from a European standpoint of view, it's becoming uh, somehow uh, uh, some, a new normal. It's uh, not that easy when you're based in uh, other region from time to time. Okay, great. So that, that, um, that public policy engagement, Nick, that um, you talked about obviously takes on a different shade and different geographies. But how, how about you, Nick? Have you seen the, that sort of dynamic between owners and managers recently? Yeah, sure. So I sort of agree with everything Caroline said, but building on what she said, I think coal is really at the front edge of the energy transition. And so when we think about screening policies, coal is very much in that bucket, along with sort of uh, activities like deforestation as well. However, when you do screen out of coal, you do take away that power to influence companies and that power investors have as engagers as well. So we have to think about when we're trying to create an impact on absolute 
global greenhouse gas emissions, what is the best action that investors can take? And sometimes it is owning companies that do have coal exposure and trying to bring forward their coal phase out dates in line with the climate analytics research and the PPCA guidelines. Great. Thanks, Nick. I'm going, to, I'm going to move on to our business leaders now, but I'll bring you back in later. One, one thing actually on this topic that seems to be quite hot at the moment when we're talking about needing to shut fossil fuel assets, maybe, maybe ahead of their originally intended life, is how do we avoid them just going off into summer with worse governance and actually being run for longer? So I'd love to come back for some views on that. But let, let's, let's turn to our business leaders now. We've got Brian, Denise and Claire. Um, so actually, you know, three very different um, voices from three different, very different perspectives. Brian from a, a, a power utility, Denise from an engineering consultant, and Claire from um, the, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. But Brian, let, let, let me start with you. Um, you know, obviously right at the front end as a utility of this um, transition that we're talking about. Um, tell us a bit about how for, for, for Capital Power, joining the, the Powering Pass Coal Alliance fits with your overall goals and, and and maybe you can add a bit of color to the, what the minister gave us an indication of what you're up to but maybe you could add a bit of color to that okay um thank you nigel you know first i would like to thank the minister for his kind remarks but capital power is very pleased to be joining the powering pass coal alliance as we work to be net carbon neutral by 2050 we're committed to advancing clean energy transition in canada and look forward to collaborating with ppca and its members as we work to transform our energy system to support a low carbon future, our Genesee facility is the hub of innovation and commercial application of new technologies and this drive for change. We're pleased to work with ECCC and the PPCA to share our perspectives and experience in involving our Genesee facility in a way that embraces innovation and reduces emissions while continuing to support the delivery of reliable, affordable, and sustainable electricity for Albertans and Canadians. Comprised of three relatively young best-in-class coal generating units, Genesee has been a focal point for our world-leading optimization, efficiency, and emission reduction initiatives for the last number of years. To reach our net carbon neutral by 2050 goal and our 2030 emissions reduction targets, we announced a billion dollar initiative to transform our Genesee facility to natural gas power generation and in coal fire generation in 2023, six years ahead of the legislated off coal date. This initiative includes repowering two of the units with best in class uh, natural gas combined cycle technology that will be hydrogen capable and carbon conversion ready and resulting in what will be Canada's most efficient natural gas combined cycle units. The remaining unit at the facility will be converted to natural gas and altogether this initiative will deliver an increased capacity of 560 megawatts while delivering 3.4 million tons of annual carbon emission reductions. We're also developing a carbon conversion facility at the site and in the early engineering stage of a carbon capture facility, which may result in a further 3 million ton reduction in CO2 before 2030. Achieving net carbon neutral by 2050, as well as our 2030 emissions reduction targets, aligns us with the broad goals of the PPCA and its members and has contributed to our decision to grow and to join. An equally important consideration was the PPCA's recognition of the need to ensure a just transition for employees and communities impacted by the coal phase out. Our membership in PPCA, in a sense, formalizes the strong relationship we've developed with ECCC and the PPCA, reflecting our commitment to responsible power generation, innovation, and our more recent net carbon neutral by 2050 commitment. Thanks, Brian. Maybe just add, um, just add a flavor to what what are the challenges of the just transition in this case? You know, you're 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 not you're not shutting a facility down completely. You're transitioning it. Do you have other, other big community impacts in there? Big employment impacts? Oh, or is, it, or is it more? Is it more in the, in the supply side where the coal is coming from? Well, we actually have mine mouth coal. 
So we've got okay. a, a facility, a, a coal mine right there. We're, you know, we're about, you know, uh, 80 kilometers away from any center. But what it does do is significantly impact on the tax base of the area. You know, if you were totally shuttering coal, you're shutting down the mine at the same time as you're significantly reducing the staff at the site, because I think as everybody knows, staffing a, a coal facility takes a lot more people than simply uh, staffing a combined cycle facility. And that's part of the reason why we've got these other initiatives taking place at Genesee, trying to absorb some of the, uh, some of the impact on the community. So it does have uh, locally very, very significant impacts. It's great to hear that because you're thinking about that, it actually affects some of you thinking about what, how you might mitigate that through those other projects. That, thank you, Brian. We'll come back to you in a minute. Um, let me let, let, let me let me turn to um, Denise now. Um, Denise, um, same question for you, but but I'm sure the story is going to be very different because you're you know you're an engineering consultancy. So it'd be really interesting to have, maybe you could start by giving us a sense of um, what McDonald's client base and then and then what joining PPCA means to you and, and, and why you've done that. Yeah, of course, Nigel, thank you. So I'm a member of the group board at Mock McDonald and the group sponsor for sustainability and climate change. And I suppose your question about our client, our client base is an interesting one because you know, we cover asset owners, those who um, operate assets. We, we cover the construction phase, the design phase of projects, their origination, and we do that globally. So we've got a very, very varied um, client base. Um, and for us, actually, despite the loss in revenue from phasing out coal fire generation from our portfolio, it's a really necessary decision because we're employee owned and our people, my colleagues, are wholly in favour of us pursuing a net zero energy pathway consistent with meeting the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. For asset owners, governments and institutions who all form our clients, entering this process of phasing out coal, the most difficult aspect is often in dealing with the industry and supply chain involved in the entire process from coal production to generation. This involves incentivizing the change from coal and implementing alternative forms of energy supply, which also addresses the economic and social impacts we were just hearing about from Brian, mm -hmm. as well as achieving the primary goal of emissions reduction and environmental sustainability. I should add that improving social outcomes is at the core of our purpose as an organization, and we're really alert to some of the challenges that Brian was just talking about. We appreciate that coal plants provide the base load requirements in many countries, particularly those with indigenous coal that provide significant employment in the entire business chain from mine to power station. These plants sometimes have significant remaining economic life and even moving to transition technologies ahead of the planned retirement for coal requires financial investment beyond that of the coal plant, but to also manage that social and economic impact again, which is to reiterate, which we're just hearing about. So we do welcome moves by the IFIs to support this transition. Um, I guess, sorry, no, sorry. No, 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 sorry, continue. But, so I was just going to say really that joining the Power Impasse Pole Alliance fits really well with our climate goals. We made the decision to stop working on new, new build coal fired generation projects in 2018. And since then, our work's primarily consisted of closing out existing contract commitments expected to be complete in OECD countries well before 2030 and non-OECD countries before 2040. Um, so the only coal-fired generation work we consider now would be projects to improve emissions performance and reduce the environmental impacts of existing stations, such as alternate fuels and or carbon capture usage and storage or decommissioning of existing plants. I mean, and Denise, it sounds like in the end that was a relatively straightforward decision because you had a huge employee backing, but that's often for a, for a consultancy a really difficult challenge, right? You know, consultancies are often serving the whole economy and so it's you're, you're you're literally having to sacrifice a part of the overall profit pool, right? But it was what was the hardest bit of making the decision? I guess for us, we try not to walk away from clients, but we might walk away from projects. So, right. so most of the clients in our client base, you know, are all aligned with a, a shift, to, you know, this energy transition shift. Um, towards net zero, that the timeframes might vary, as we were hearing earlier from some of the, the sort of finance people who spoke, but broadly aligned with going on this journey, and some just aren't quite sure how to do it. So, so when when originating, when developing, when designing some of the schemes that clients bring to us, we can work with them on that transition. As I say, I, I think um, yeah, to, to do that rather than just to say, you know, no. <laughs> there's a big education piece here isn't there which we've maybe not picked up on so far in this conversation right, great thank you denise really really helpful and also 
um, just for my education, um, is that so you you said you're employee owned, so, so that that means there's a different kind of decision making process for things like this than 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 a than a sort of than a board run organisation or yeah, we are that we we do have a board and we have an oversight um, committee too, which is made up of um, employees uh, as well. So, but, but as a board, what being employee owned does is give us that sort of agility and give us that absolute commitment to our organisational purpose to deliver. Yeah. So we don't have outside investors influencing our decision making. Our decisions are made by those of us who are part of that ownership model. Right, great. It really is because I mean something I'm hearing more and more is how young in the war for talent, like young the best young engineers or the best young talent of any stripe are looking for companies with very clear purpose and targets and plans. So I guess if um, and if you're if you're managing yourself as employees and you internalize that, that's something I think in, in, across all sectors is happening, right? Absolutely. And only last year we published some really clear commitments about both the net zero agenda and the adaptation and resilience and piece as well in terms of risk assessment. So we were certified as carbon neutral by the Carbon Trust last year, uh, and we have our own sort of action plan to achieving net zero as a business. Fantastic. Thank you, Denise. Um, let me turn now to, to Claire, Claire O'Neill from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Claire, another diff a different player in the business ecosystem, a very influential one. I see that your, your kind of map of world domination behind you with, no with nodes everywhere. So there's another- plants. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, really exciting here that the WBCST is joining the Power and Pass Tell a little bit about about why you're joining and how you're hoping to, um, you know, what you're hoping to to drive as a result of this. Thank you, Nigel. Great to see you. And so good to hear this. So just a sort of mode of backdrop. So I set up the Power and Pass Coal Alliance along with my friend Catherine McKinna. We created this literally. We sat down in uh, Unger, the Climate Action Week, and sat down with a, with a napkin and said, the UK has got these really ambitious coal phase out commitments. So has Canada. How do we turn this into a thing? And we started from a tiny base. And, you know, the PPCA has done amazingly well in terms of its membership and its influence. And I like to think that the one third of the OECD coal power that's now being scheduled to close by 2030 is a direct result of the PPCA's lobbying. But it was very interesting, actually, you know, Germany, which was a big, a big national commitment when Germany committed to 2038 coal phase out with all of the transitional questions that Brian and others have talked about. That was a big, uh, a big vote of confidence in this um, multinational uh, initiative. So I now sit at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which represents 200 of the world's most ambitious sustainable companies. It's been around for a quarter of a century. About 12 of our members are also signatories of the PPCA pledges. And it seemed to me that one of the ways to get into the really difficult questions, the hard to abate questions is, using the power of a supply chain, basically saying, how do you get multinational global companies to work with their suppliers to deliver coal-free um, you know, goods and services? And so we've agreed to join PPCA as a sort of corporate activation partner to leverage this fantastic organization and the pledges and the commitments through our corporate membership. And, and really just a couple of quick comments on, on the underlying challenge, which I think Nick and others have alluded to, that no matter your view of the energy transition, I think it's pretty clear to everybody that we've got to make coal history. We can debate whether that's a shift to gas, which is actually what led to the huge decarbonisation in the UK, or we can debate whether it's a, a, a leap to renewables. But the thing everyone can agree on is that is the fact that there are very cost effective solutions and Brian talked about this already there where you convert can convert from coal to gas you can halve your emissions of course you have to think very carefully about what that looks like from an employment uh, and local economy point of view but what you also get is an immediate improvement in local health conditions and I know in Canada we had uh, various uh, state uh, leaders saying that they got rid of smog when they phased out coal coal fired generation so there were lots of co-benefits as well so I think it's this sense of everyone can agree on it it. Um, however, it's difficult. So there are lots of political and economic uh, restrictions around the coal phase out. It's not easy to say to countries like South Africa, renewables are cheap, just shut down ESCOM and you'll be fine. It doesn't work like that. So there are lots of really, really tough questions that I think we've collectively got to answer. But our hope is that bringing in 
this very powerful membership uh, organization, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, we can really help to amplify the need for this, improve the uh, and extend the messaging and really get companies to think about what they can do through their supply chain. So absolutely thrilled to be uh, back involved and, and huge credit, by the way, to the PPCA for doing such a good job over the last few years. It's, it's lovely that you can full circle from that from from inventing it on the napkin to on a really napkin. Dri driving it. Um, to, to, to say a bit more about about um, supply chain, do you mean encouraging suppliers to join? Yes. To say so a bit more about. So if you think, so so one of the real questions, and you know, there are certain countries, and China is one of them, where um, that actually, uh, of course, that there, there are still expansions of coal for power, but increasingly you're looking at coal being used for industrial processes and heat, which is not part of the original PPCA mandates. And, and that's, I think, you know, important that we focus on the power generation. But what are the real incentives for, a, in many cases, a regional uh, administration to, to, to make those switches? Well, one of them is if you're big overseas clients are basically saying we won't buy goods and services unless they're coming out of a, a coal-free factory, if you like, putting some demand uh, pressure in the system, as well as what I think we also need, which is a bigger conversation, which is what the PM referred to as the sort of Marshall funds. I think we have to focus a lot of this global funding that we talk about on the coal challenge. But I guess, Nigel, it's that sense of what is it the business community can do through its trading mechanisms to actually influence domestic policy, because we know we don't have a global, we don't have a global carbon price, which would help also to, to drive this transition. We don't have a global mandation in terms of energy supply, but what we do have is a highly connected, very effective uh, global business community, many of whom are members of the World Business Council. Yeah, no, I see. I, I remember, um, I mean, Mindy Luber, who many of you will know, who runs the series explaining that, um, when in the early days of the RE100 campaigns, there's obviously some similarities here in terms of um, the, you know, we're only going to buy renewable energy. That um, the, the conversation with the state capital in America was very different um, in terms of um, exactly as you said that demand. Like if you want inward investment and if you want jobs and you want tax, you're going to have to provide um, coal-free power um so that's it that's it it's, so you don't have to make an environmental argument right you can yeah. make a very hard and, nose and, model and, and if i may and i think one of this is one of the very exciting things about ppc and it's so great to see new members today because it sharpens that renewable energy commitment because yes of course we can commit to buying renewable energy but it is still the fact that coal consumption it, you know continues to rise in many parts of the world so let's just put coal in the spotlight yeah. and, and have a real win of making coal history as part a part of this transition that we've got to go through so i think it just sharpens the focus on coal so i think we can we can we can confidently expect many more than 12 wbcsd members to be right to think in, we'd in, like to expand it in, in ppca by the time we get to Glasgow. thank you claire um um right i want to i, I um just a warning to all panelists that I'm now going to freestyle and ignore all the questions you had earlier because I think there's more interesting questions to ask. Um, I want to come back to, to our three um, uh, finance sector um, speakers, um, Carolyn, Nick, and Claudia. Um, two things. One, one I sort of just touched upon it at the end of that. Um, we've had experience in Europe of when this transition happens. It can get very messy and there could be a lot of value destruction we've ended up splitting utilities into sort of good 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 bank bad bank type splits um what one thing that i hear increasingly is that be careful that you just force people to sell assets so that they are now coal free but the coal hasn't gone from the economy how do you think about th that and of course that's not just an issue for coal it's an issue for other hard to abate sectors, but we're really interested to hear from all three of you how you think about that in terms of um, engagement and divestment. That if you if if you or if we force a company to divest of a coal asset, but it's just bought by someone else who maybe doesn't have the same high levels of governance and transparency, it doesn't necessarily lead to a net benefit um, for um, our, our our for actually closing down the coal capacity. How do how do you think about that? And, and I mean, Nick, Cowley, and Cloudy, just just wave at me whoever wants to go first. Nick. Happy, happy to start off. Uh, it's something I think about a lot and we do have this concern that there's this leakage, if you like, from public markets where there's a lot of attention from investors to private markets. I think there's research from the Oxford Energy Institute um, that shows the increasing cost of capital for coal 
over time. And that is in part due to the marginalization of coal within the financial industry. So I think that is the potential benefit from it going into these pure play coal players. But we have to look at this from an absolute greenhouse gas emissions perspective and what is the impact on that. And so it is a concern that we do see this divestment. And what we want to see as preference is the closure of these assets and the reuse of these assets, conversion into utility scale, solar utility scale storage, for example. Thanks, Caroline. Yes, I, I think what we have been doing in engage banks and insurers uh, uh, around their own call policy, because wh when you are looking at if an asset is uh, is uh, taking off the public market into the private market, you still need to have to, to insure it, and you still need to somehow the uh, the, the private buyer will use leverage coming from banks to, to buy it. So if you if we are engaging at the same time uh, with the banks and the insurance about their own coal phase out a plan or their uh, coal policy, you, you somehow you, um, you cut the possibility of the private market to take off this, to, to, to buy this assets. And I think uh, the only way, uh, because you will always have this kind of, uh, of trend or, and if, you, if all the insurers were stopping insuring coal assets, you know you will dry the <laughs> the market. So it's why we ne really need to engage as well uh, the banking industry and the insurance industry. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. I know, I mean, within the Glasgow Financial Alliance that we launched with Mark Kearney, of course, there's all the different race to zero elements for owners, managers, and banks. I know that asset owners have a very clear Cold. Yeah, but on the insurance side, it's not the asset owner. The no, not, not their but, investment is the underwriting uh, level, just, I, which I is powerful. That's the point I was going to make: is that yeah. the asset owners have a clear position, but are the banks and the um, and the asset managers groups and the and the the, new, the soon to be launched insurance group. Um, so I think we, your, I think your point is, we if those are collective positions that that, that all the net zero commitment um, platforms hold, and that will. If you like, close the door on some of the some of the ways out, Claudia, any thoughts on that? Sorry, sorry, Caroline, you want to? No, I just want to. When we're engaging, we have really to to be careful on the cold policy of the insurance and banking side because usually they are announcing great policy, and when you read it, it's not always as good as it sounds. So we have really to be careful to 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 add them to have a, a policy which is across their all activities to 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 uh, to lower the possibility of them uh, being uh, supportive to any coal uh, assets great thank you Gary. Cla Claudia any thoughts on that question yeah I think the only thing I can uh, add to this is um, to say one not needs to be careful or always clear what does one engage on does one engage on you know, immediate divestment of assets or does one engage you know, does one is, is one still in the role of provider of capital and not sit in the seat of the management? Or does one engage for a really clear strategy for phase out um, and, and thereby would also allow a sort of more, uh, you know, in some cases, a more responsible divestment? Or that could also be then part of the phase of strategy, of course, no new capacity being added. Great. Let me just ask you one last question. Um, you know, in your own experience within your institutions of um, make going from a point when there was not a policy of coal phase out to the now being a policy of coal phase out, what was the hardest um, bit of the of, of the sort of internal decision making process for each of you that might might shed some light on on the challenges for others? Um. Yeah, Claudia. Yeah, I can perhaps uh, take a, the, this question more from the side of what is really needed. I think from an asset owner perspective, it is an understanding of what your beneficiaries want to, to really hear them out and sort of find that as a support strategy. Um, during the policy making process, we also used uh, academic studies to look into impact on, on investment performance, etc. So it was a very 
well thought out stakeholder engagement process, in addition to, of course, a lot of very thorough work that went into target setting and also considering the implementation aspects. And um, so that's what I would uh, perhaps um, advise anyone or give anyone with them if they continue embark on this journey. Yeah, because interesting, you reminded us at the beginning that as a as a pension fund manager, you have a very long time horizon thinking about um, yeah. beneficial members who you'll be supporting in their retirement in 50, 60, sometimes even 70 years. So it's just... Yeah. So it's, exactly, and the interesting thing is also, you know, a lot of, for example, we've had quite a bit of engagement success in Asia, but Asia is a bit far away from the Netherlands. So you also make it you know, locally tangible. So we have an energy transition portfolio that is focused on the Netherlands. So I think, you know, think also about the local global aspect in it to make a tangible contribution to your immediate environment as well. Great, thank you, Claudia. Nick, Nick Cowley, what would be the one tough thing that you cracked that you'd use to advise others who are about to embark? happy to go first. I think the two sort of ongoing challenges is one around data and there's a lot of information around the utility side of things but we need to make sure we focus throughout the whole value chain in terms of enacting our policy. I think the second one is uh, around socialization of the policy within a large institution and making sure that uh, all of the portfolio managers are on board with any perceived limitations they might have in terms of their investment strategy. Let me, let, me, let me try and translate. Let me. I'm going to try and translate Nick's sort of very, very um, sort of um, side, sideways comment there. That my experience, certainly having been on the, the board of a public pension fund, is that the the framing amongst the asset manager community, portfolio managers, can often be that there is automatically assumed to be a trade off between anything that restricts their ability to completely freely invest in anything they like. So. Um, like, so if it's if it's ESG or green or ethical or responsible, there's often an assumption that that's automatically so so educating to that that is not necessarily the case um, is a key part of getting them on board, right, Nick? So I think I think that's a kind of part of the structural shift in the whole industry. Um, Car Caroline, uh, last I, word from the finance. I think strategy. there's two difficulties. First, when a certain fund manager would focus on emerging market or in the US or and their own market or even in Japan, their own market are not in line with the phase out 2030, 2040 phase out plan. And they are starting from very huge coal exposure. So it will be much more difficult for them and sometimes uh, it's quite difficult for them to 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 uh, to see the point and you know to see the rush uh, to phase out. And the second point is it's more about you know one of the the key thing we have to do together is to to uh, make sure that the emerging markets are also phasing out and they are doing their own f uh, uh, energy transition. And sometimes because of the asset allocation the global uh, asset allocation we have, it's more, it's uh, sometimes easier to, uh, to finance the uh, energy transition in our, uh, uh, in the developed markets and in the emerging market. Uh, but we need to do this, this and we need to do this in a term which is compatible with the risk return profile of what our clients uh, need, but, but we need to find some solution to finance this energy transition in the emerging markets. So, so if I understand that your first point would be, for example, um, a, a, a German fund manager coming from a developed country with a 2038 phase out date, trying to tell other people to have an earlier phase out date. It's, it's, yeah. it's a bit, of course, we expect that date to come forward now because of the court case. But and your second point, I think, very related to one that Claire made about the, uh, the Green Marshall Plan, that we have to find ways to finance the transition everywhere. Otherwise, we just have transition in one part of the world and the overall problem is not solved. Thank you, Caroline. Really, re really helpful. Um, so th thank you, Claudia and Nick as well. Great to get that insight and, and great to have you all in the Power Pass Coal Alliance. Let, let me turn for just some final thoughts to um, our business leaders and. Um, Brian, um, you know you 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 come from the sector that um, has to make this transition, right? Has to phase it out. What would your advice be to other utilities who are considering joining Power and Pass Coal Alliance? What would be the kind of killer arguments you'd make to them to get them to join 
Because obviously, if we had every electric utility in the world in the Power and Pass Coal Alliance, then we'd have solved the problem, right? Right. Right. Well, I think I think part of it is just from a fundamental perspective is is for organizations to recognize that phasing out coal is inevitable. Right. You know, it's not there's not choices that it's inevitable. So it's how do you address that? And it doesn't mean that it, you have to shutter plants and create massive unemployment and and, and uh, create huge community problems. There are choices. And the earlier you address that and the earlier you work with other stakeholders, with equipment manufacturers, with investors, you you can find a path that again isn't isn't necessarily as rewarding as the path today financially, but they are paths and they are they are, they can retain a significant amount of value, you know, for all stakeholders. You know, we've had a number of bumps ourselves. We've gone, we've had some, I'll call it environmental bumps that, you know, cut our share price in half. Today and going down this path, we are actually hitting all-time, you know, share price highs. So I mean, it is it, it is in the long term a challenge, but you know, when you get past it, it is certainly um, it is certainly positive. And the other thing is today in Canada, you know, we feel with the governments and with our stakeholders, they're actually working with us and not against us, which is a huge, huge difference in sort of the dynamics and so and again you know we in part create that environment it's not just what's decreed by governments or pressure or, or other policies it actually takes a significant amount of, of effort and time and vision of companies like ours to be able to find that path and to get everybody sort of or get us you know in the same uh, in, in, in going in the same direction as as the uh, the rest of the world needs to go yeah i think right that's that's um when when industry and government have agreed on end goals it makes that collaboration much easier doesn't it if we all if we can all agree we're going to get to net zero and that's going to include a coal phase out then you can start to work on the mechanics of agreed milestones rather than arguing about the milestones so that, that collaboration seems really important thank you brian really Great. really interesting um Denise, how about um, from, from your perspective, what's the one piece of advice that you'd give to, to business leaders um, on joining uh, to get them to join the PPCA? I guess I can only echo and build on what Brian said, because it was really clear in, in that message, you know, it's inevitable and we need some joint um, ultimate goals that we're all working towards. So my thing would be just to, to work with others, you know, that this, this is a fabulous alliance, isn't it, for knowledge sharing, for, for creation of stepping stones you don't have to invent it all yourself and you can look to others and see what they've done and how they've regenerated um, and and not just others within one sector but but across multiple sectors as well in multiple parts of the world so so my thing my advice my thing my advice would be go on go on the journey with others and and that will build momentum and and that positive momentum will lead to creativity and innovation which will make the journey much smoother Great, thanks, Tony. Let me it just trigger a thought there. We've talked, we've talked about the fact, or, or we've asserted, I think, and we agree collectively that having a having a clear time frame for a complicated transition makes managing the transition easier for for businesses and for communities and for individuals. Right? If you know if you know the direction of travel, and you can invest in retraining, or you can be helped in that. Um, do we need to start thinking about other inevitable parts of this transition? I mean, you know, we. we like gas is we're not going to be burning gas forever now it's 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 going to be phased out later than coal but do we need to be start thinking about about that as well i mean does that follow the same logic the, the energy transition you know the, the transition to net zero has to be considered systemically all, all all parts of the system are connected out there it's one of the things that makes it really really difficult it's one of the things that uh, conceptually makes it hard for people to understand how we will get to that that end game but, but as Brian just said, you know, the sooner we recognise the need for change and start to act on it, the easier that will be. And, and we'll be able to build confidence in all those constituencies you just said, but also in the investment community um, who we've been hearing from earlier. Yeah, you, you, you just, I just remembered that when the, when the UK government was consulting on the phase out of combustion engines, the, the question they posed was, should it be 2032 or 2035? Because pre previously it had been 2040. And one of the things that... Um, I think most surprised many people was that Shell, which last time any of us checked, made money selling 
petrol for people to run combustion engines, actually said, no, 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 don't do it in 2032, 2035, do it in 2030. Really interesting because everyone's like, why is this CEO of Shell saying that? Because to, it removes the uncertainty, it allows us to plan, it means we won't waste um, um, capex guessing when something's going to happen. So I think this, that seems to me to be, this is huge uncertainty for everybody at every level. So whatever we can do to have clear milestones within, with, with, with time to react is really helpful. Um, Claire, let me, let, let me come to you finally. Um, you, you uniquely have this, you know, come, come from this perspective of being a government minister and coming up with um, world-changing plans on napkins to work, to work to working with two hundred of the world's world's, big, world's biggest um, um, and most influential companies. Um, so, let, just ask you, what would what, what's your advice to companies to get them to join the? But then I want to come at how do we get this green Marshall Plan mobilised? What's the because that seems to me the Marshall Plan was a massive mobilisation of American money to to help other economies grow. That's a difficult sell domestically. Yeah. Right. So, how would you? What what cases would you make to policymakers to fund and support that global transition? Well, thank you, Nigel. I mean, and again, huge thanks to the panel. It's so good to see the membership coming in. I mean, I think the the, the advice to companies and indeed to, to governments, and it actually relates to the question that David posted in the chat, is we're in danger of making perfect the enemy of the good when it comes to climate. So if we had approached the COVID pandemic the way some people to want us to approach climate, we would have said, don't do anything until we have the perfect vaccine. And that is not the way you solve problems. You solve problems by going after the biggest issues first. It's the Mark Carney argument. You go after the big emission pools. So your point about gas is an extremely good one. We have to have a, a vision for gas. But there are too many people saying, no, 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 no. We can't do anything until we have an entire grid that is capable of running a renewable energy. And by the way, there are a billion people in the world who have no access to any form of energy. They're still burning biomass and dung. And that is when we COP goes to Africa next year. Year, that will be much more part of the conversation. So I think we have to start with pragmatism and focus on the big emission pools. And coal is still responsible for a third of global warming. And it's and, and it's not easy, but it's demonstrably doable to get the world off coal. So let's let's focus on that big challenge first. And, and bear in mind all the other challenges we need to face, but just kind of focus on that. And the second thing is, you know, let's also uh, focus on this. Um, you know, the sense of urgency. I mean, if you want the numbers, you and I both talk about this, the fact that the Keeling curve showing carbon's the highest it's been for four and a half million years. So we don't have time to sit around and create perfect. We have a burning platform that we have to absolutely, absolutely deal with. And this is where I think the Marshall Plan argument, you're quite right, that was presented as a sort of jobs and growth plan, but people don't talk enough about the opportunity and the innovation that's in this space. So let's talk about carbon capture and sport storage. And there's an ideological argument to be had do we like carbon capture and storage in the ppca well that's a very important word which was unabated in the original mission so if we can create zero carbon fossil fuel how do we feel about that some people may say that's a good pragmatic solution there is real technology transfer and real opportunity and i think that is where you start to win the political hearts and minds which is to say Yes, there are huge opportunities in the renewable space, offshore wind, the great UK uh, renewable resource, but let's think about how we rapidly decarbonize now and where the innovation is. And, you know, it's not and, and actually, again, I think there were some great statements that came out of the G7. I think there was some, you know, the coal messaging out of the G7 was really, really powerful. And using that into the COP and making this the coal, the COP that makes coal history would be such an amazingly good outcome. Wonderful. Thank you, Claire. Um... Well, let me let me thank everybody. Um, great to have so many um, articulate and committed new members to the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Um, as we've heard, it's the biggest, fastest thing that we can do to get emissions going down, um, anything like close to the speed we need to. And uh, the great thing about this coalition is that the more people join, it's it's, it's sort of non-linear impact. I mean, it, it really starts to get, create a sense of the inevitability, um, which, which we've heard about. Um, and, and, and interestingly, I think we've heard today about an interplay between businesses and investors that they can encourage each other just as through their commitments, uh, they can encourage um, uh, uh, pol policymakers. So um, I think that, um, you know, it leaves me to close the panel by saying, let's get um, a load more people. If anyone's listening who hasn't joined yet, join, you'll be in very good company. And being in company makes the journey 
um, more fun, but also also much easier. It de-risks it. Um, I think that the um, both the declaration and the finance principles of the Paring Pass Coal Alliance um, provide a very good rubric to help guide that chance. I, I do know that you know we talked about the, the importance of aligning all the different finance players to avoid those um, the kind of maybe unintended consequences. I know that the the UN Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance already has come up with a coal phase out policy with input from the Paring Pass Coal Alliance. I'd really like to encourage the other race to zero um, uh, finance initiatives, asset owners, banks, soon to be launched insurance, to also work on their own published coal phase out policy. Um, I think responding to the IEA's recent um, fantastic report, which has been really helpful, and, and I'm sure PPCA could help with that as well as they have with the asset owners. Um, you know, we, 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 this, Claire's point, this really is a race. We call it the race to zero, and the race to take coal out of the economy is one of the first laps in that race. Um, so with that, um, I thank a fantastic group of speakers and I wish everybody um, an enjoyable rest of the day, whether you're just about to go to bed or whether you just had your first cup of coffee. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.